Um, all right, so we are uh, excited to have all of you back again on this Saturday morning. Um, and uh, we're welcoming Professor Baud here uh, for uh, his paper. And uh, our, moder our, uh, our commenter is going to be Professor Adler uh, here from Duke. Uh, so uh, Professor Baud. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for having me out here. Um, so <clears throat> when I present this paper to audiences that are not in this room, I usually start by saying, the goal here is to say something new about originalism, improbable though that may be. Uh, to this room, I feel like I have to instead say, the goal here is to sort of push forward what has become a new way of thinking about originalism that I think a lot of people in the room are somewhat familiar with. Um, <clears throat> and that is to think about sort of what I call the positive turn, uh, a, different, a different set of justifications for originalism. Um, so to run through the background anyway, just a little bit, uh, right now, the sort of existing set of arguments about, about should we be originalist or not tend to take one of two tracks. Uh, one track is the arguments that I call conceptual, uh, which is kind of an amalgam of arguments that are based on language. Uh, the nature of language is some kind of originalism inherent in the nature of communication, or maybe in the nature of written communication, or maybe in the nature of written constitutional communication. Uh, and also some arguments based on democracy and popular sovereignty that are, that are somewhat similar. Um, these arguments have met a bunch of rejoinders like, well, uh, you can actually see that originalism is not inherently true because we've seen other things done. Uh, and there are various counter arguments that are used, whether that's interpretation of poetry, interpretation of scripture, slightly more promisingly, interpretation of written constitutions in other legal regimes that appear not to, not to always be originalist, although whether that's true or not is itself a kind of complicated, contested area um, about comparative originalism and how to understand it and so on. Anyway, that's sort of, that's one set of the, of the track that exists. Uh, the other form, of course, are more straightforward normative arguments. That is, does originalism successfully serve some other set of values, uh, whether that's judicial restraint or the protection of liberty or at my home institution, sort of naked cost-benefit analysis and welfareism. Um, but, but you know, does originalism maximize those things uh, better or worse than various alternatives? Those arguments are also, of course, somewhat intractable because the values that we're trying to maximize are quite contested. And then the questions of whether originalism maximizes those values are even more contested. So <clears throat> the goal here is to provide, uh, I guess, a sort of third way forward, um, that rather than starting with those normative and conceptual questions, we should start with the more contingent, more lawyerly question of whether originalism is, in a positive sense, our law. Uh, and I mean that in a kind of, uh, this paper is not a technical jurisprudence paper, but there's sort of a certain amount of that going on under the hood, so to speak. But I mean, as a matter of our collective social practices, the practice of constitutional law in America today, uh, is that originalism? Is, is originalism uh, what we're doing? Uh, and there's a sense in which that might seem obviously wrong. Uh, we all know that originalism is this thing done by only a couple of Supreme Court justices and a few dozen academics and can't possibly describe American constitutional practice in a broader sense. But I think that's wrong. Um, I think that when Justice Kagan says at her confirmation hearing, we're all originalists now, uh, in a certain sense, there's actually, she's actually right. Uh, she's on to something. That there's a, a good definition of originalism under which that's true, and that has some important implications. So people have, have read the paper, but the kind of three, the three key moves to see this, I think. The first is to understand uh, the different kinds of things one can mean by originalism. And in the existing literature, there's often this, this uh, false dichotomy between exclusive originalism, the idea that constitutional cases should always be resolved just by looking at kind of the text itself and what the founders thought about the text, that that's, that's exclusive originalism. It's the only criterion of constitutional law. There's no pluralism. There's no other stuff uh, versus some kind of a, a pluralist conception. Um, People who've read Philip Bobbitt's Constitutional Fate call this modalities. People who've read Dick Fallon call it constitutional pluralism. There are a series of their names for it. And that version is something like, well, there are a set of things we do in constitutional interpretation, a set of factors. Original meaning is one of them. It's a pretty important factor. But you know, there are some other factors, and there's some kind of nebulous weighing process that goes on. And I think that's a, 
that's a sort of false dichotomy. Uh, it, it misses the, the intermediate but important possibility that originalism is uh, not just one method, but sort of the super method, the, the supreme method um, of interpreting. That is, <clears throat> when interpreting the Constitution, you start with the text itself and its original meaning. And if that sort of is clear and does not permit reference to anything else, you stop there. Uh, if it is not, if it is open textured in some way, or if it indicates that one should proceed to use some other kind of interpretation, then you do. But even there, it's not like, oh, there's ambiguity, so it's open season. It's uh, the permission to use a certain set of methods of constitutional interpretation that are themselves commanded or permitted by the original meaning of the text. Uh, and in the paper, I talk about precedent. I talk about liquidation. I talk about the use of other methods of sort of resolving vagueness or ambiguity as examples of this. So the picture is sort of, uh, rather than a sort of flat set of modalities, it's more like a, a pyramid uh, with original meaning at the top, uh, controlling access to all of the others. Um, now, once you think about things in this way, I think, and then you start to look at, at our constitutional practice, um, I, think, I think maybe it starts to actually line up. Uh, you start to see that while uh, judicial opinions regularly employ a bunch of different methods of interpretation, uh, originalism actually has a special role uh, in a couple of ways. So one is when the court explicitly talks about methodological clashes, uh, it seems to say that, that the original meaning can, can trump other ones. So when policy concerns are raised in District of Columbia versus Heller or in INS v. Chadha, uh, the court does not say, oh, well, we can fight these, you know, maybe these policy concerns are, are wrong. Here are some sort of argument to the contrary. Uh, it says, no, we don't care. Uh, the original meaning of the Constitution and the text of the Constitution take this question off the table. Uh, by contrast, you never see the court do, the, do it the other way around. You never see the court uh, say, well, the, the text or the original meaning are clear, but, but um, we're going to trump them for some other methodology. And I think that's embodied particularly uh, particularly importantly in the court's recess appointments decision recently in Noel Canning versus NLRB, where all of the opinions seem to agree that, that original meaning and the clear original meaning is the first step, and that other methods that are pedigreed to the original meaning are the second step. Uh, and so I, that's sort of the, the kind of picture I have. And then I also think that if you look at the major constitutional opinions, sort of canonical opinions today that are supposed to refute originalism or show that it is not uh, all of our law, Brown, Blaisdell, and so on, and, and actually look at them, they also are consistent with this picture. They all uh, seem to say that you have to, have to start with the original meaning and, and sort of fight it to a draw or find some room in it before you're allowed to go on and do anything else. Uh, so I don't claim this is a complete proof by any means, but I think once you once you take these kinds of of observations about the existing state of constitutional law, I think the most plausible thing that emerges is that this form of originalism is actually our our constitutional law. Uh, I should say that's also backed up by some sort of higher order points that may seem obvious but still still important, like the fact that the text of the Constitution is. The one, we, the one we print in the back of case books and carry around in our pockets is the one that meets the original criteria for amending and not one that includes a bunch of additional unwritten amendments. Um, the fact that we don't talk in terms of having a second or third or fourth or fifth constitutional regime since the founding. Uh, the fact that we talk in terms of, say, lawful continuity with the founding as uh, a paper by Steve Sachs talked about last year. So I think there's sort of a, a lot there too. Um, and then finally, you know, I, the promise is that this descriptive claim will actually get us somewhere. Uh, that part of the paper is a little bit more tentative. But the basic idea I have in mind is that there is much more widespread agreement on the normative proposition that judges ought to obey the law. The judges ought to, you know, the law may be ambiguous. There may be questions or uncertainty about what it is or how to find it. But whatever its bounds are, that the main judicial role is to work within it rather than to change it, and that the agents of actual change, especially in constitutional interpretation, are supposed to be somebody else. So if my descriptive claim is right, that this kind of originalism is the law, that means that there's some obligation on judges to behave in, a, in an originalist fashion. Uh, that obligation, of course, might 
be defeasible, there might be ways it can be overridden, but it ought to kind of reorient the conversation. And so that rather than asking whether originalism is inherently true or whether it is the best way of interpreting a constitution compared to any other way we can imagine, we ought to say it's our way of interpreting the constitution, whether it's inherently true or not. And so the relevant question should be whether some new proposal is good enough to be worth the uh, legal and practical transition costs of doing something else. Thank you.